Hello and welcome to week four of our exploration of Jacob. My name is Chris Hawthorne and I'm a member of the ministry team here at St Anne's Church in Chasetown. There's something curious and something marvellous about the birth of a giraffe. There's a story about a man named Paul who had a friend who was a zookeeper and is his role he looked after the giraffes. And this friend was able to allow Paul to watch a mother giraffe giving birth. And as the mother stood some part away from the two of them, towering above them, Paul looked at the keeper and he could see that the baby giraffe was had head coming out, two feet coming out, and was about ten feet off the ground. And he said to the zookeeper, when's she going to lie down? She won't, came the reply. Well, shouldn't one of us go and catch the baby, he said. To which the zookeeper said, well, you could go up to her, but you need to understand that those back legs are very strong and very powerful, and one kick from them would kill you. A few moments later, the baby giraffe fell some ten feet onto the floor, landing with a thud on its back. And they stood there and they watched, and it stayed motionless. And then something quite shocking happened. The mother giraffe repositioned herself and gave that baby giraffe a good hard kick and it shot some 10 feet away from her. And it began to move and struggle and totter and try to get up. But then it gave up and settled back on the ground. And the mother giraffe went back over to it and again kicked it hard. And it rolled across the floor and it struggled and it battled and eventually it did begin to stand on those spindly legs stand on its own four feet. And then something even more shocking happened. And the mother giraffe went over and once again kicked it hard. And it took off from the ground, flew through the air and then settled down again. And before Paul could draw breath and turn in amazement and shock, the zookeeper said to him, she wants it to survive. If it can't remember, if it doesn't learn how to get up quickly, predators will get it and it will die. Sometimes you feel as though those you expect to love you suddenly seem to kick you and kick you hard. And to an extent, that will be part of our story that we're going to read from Genesis 37. It's a story that we all know well. We probably think of it as being uh, the story of Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream cope. I think it might help if we have a little bit of context, a little bit of background to this story. Joseph was Jacob's youngest son, and he was his favorite son. Joseph was Rachel's first child, and Rachel was Jacob's favourite wife, the woman he fell in love with first of all. And later Rachel had died having given birth to Jacob in, late in her life, which also added to some of the strong feelings that Joseph had, the bond that he had with his father Jacob. As we know, Jacob had 12 other sons. Reuben was the eldest son. But Reuben had done a great wrong, and if we read Genesis 35, uh, chapter 35, round about verse 22, we're told that Reuben, the eldest son, lay with Bilhar, his father's concubine. And because of Reuben's gross immorality, he had lost not only his father's favour, but the birthright that the firstborn son is entitled to. And because of that, Jacob exercises his right as the father of 12 sons to choose who he's going to give that birthright to. And he chose the firstborn of Rachel. As I said, life is complicated and sometimes you feel you've been kicked hard by the ones that you love. And I, I think probably the other 11 sons felt it's not fair. So 
Having that background context in mind, let's read Genesis chapter 37. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhal, the sons of Zipphah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he had made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father had loved him more than any of them, they hated him, and they could not speak a kind word to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen, listen to the dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose out and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. And his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And then, later, Joseph had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said to them, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were all bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his fathers rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now, his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing their flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So Israel, Jacob, same person. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from his valley in Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, he replied. I heard them say that they were going to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these systems and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't, don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, Reuben said this, to rescue him from them and to take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern and the cistern was empty, it had no water in it. And as they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, and their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were travelling on their way to take these down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up up his blood. Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him at all. After all, he is our brother, he's our flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled up out of the cistern, Joseph, and they sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, and they took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, 
The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe into the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. Jacob recognised it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on his sackcloth and mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. And so his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. I mentioned last week in my talk that this story would be seen as an epic, an epic story. Epic stories are set over a large time span and they have great drama, great ups and downs. And Joseph's coat would have been part of an image, a symbol in that epic story. And Joseph's coat was also long. It was long-sleeved and it would have been down to his ankles. And that symbolism tells us that he was, he was a boss. He was a manager. He wasn't going out sweating and labouring in the fields. He was going out checking that the others were sweating and labouring in the fields. He gave the orders and made the decisions, whilst the others, including his brothers, who were all older than him, had to obey. On top of this, as we've read, the dreams that he had, happily shared, openly shared with his brothers, seemed to say that he was favoured, he was special. We can, at least I can, see why he wasn't popular. And in the anger and bitterness that follows his brother's plot to kill Joseph, a blood-stained supervisor's coat will suffice to prove that Jacob to, will prove to Jacob that his son was attacked by a wild animal and killed. And had that plot actually been carried out to the end they originally planned, the epic would have finished. And interestingly, it's Reuben who suggests they don't kill Joseph. And it's Judah, remember the name, one of Jacob's 12 sons. Jacob had 12 sons and they were the rulers, the starters of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the name Judah, the tribe of Judah, is the word from which we get the word Jew, Jewish, a member of Judah's tribe. And it's Judah who can see that they could profit from this. Rather than just kill him, we could sell him. So on top of getting rid of him, we make some money. When bitterness and anger are allowed to fester within us, part of us shrivels. When in our deepest thoughts we plot and plan harm to others, when we turn from God, from the pure and the holy, well, we allow evil to become our guide. For Joseph's brothers, self-pity, jealousy and anger finally pushed them over a dangerous line. They were mad at their father for his favouritism. They were mad at God for the good things that were coming to their brother and not to them. And I suppose if ultimately God is in control of every circumstance that comes into our lives, then who were they, who am I, who are any of us, to question the decisions that God makes? We are not there to judge otherwise. And there is a lesson for all of us here about anger and jealousy that can lead to hatred and bitterness. To conclude, the book of Hebrews issues a warning for us all that goes like this. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it may become 
defiled. As you know, and as we we shall see in the coming weeks, despite our human failings, God never gives up on us, even when we are bitter and angry and we feel we've been kicked hard by those we thought loved us. A prayer. Merciful Father, help us to focus on your will for our lives and to seek out that plan rather than look at other people whose lives will be taking a different route. Amen. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a good week. Take care and God bless.